The Vancouver Island Economic Alliance is all about achieving a vital and sustainable island region economy. We collaborate with stakeholders to solve problems and promote opportunities. Every October, Vaia hosts the State of the Island Economic Summit, a meeting place for ideas where you can network with decision makers and be informed of relevant grassroots trends in the island economy. VAIA's annual economic report is the only publication of its kind in Canada. It is user-friendly and puts important, timely data at your fingertips. Foreign Trade Zone Vancouver Island provides ready access to Canada's duty and tax deferral opportunities and attracts foreign direct investment to the island region. And the Island Good brand created by Vaia makes it easy for shoppers to find local products and is proven to increase sales for island producers. If it's Island Good, whether it's potatoes or gin or mattresses, it's good for our economy, good for sustainability, and good for us all. Vaia, a nonprofit membership organization that leads creation of transformative economic opportunities. Hello and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for our second presentation in the Industry Speaker Series, part of the Seven Days of Seaweed Festival. On behalf of our planning team, I'd like to thank you for taking time out of your busy schedules to join us this afternoon. Please feel free to uh, message the host anytime during the presentation with any questions that you might have, and we'll do our best to get to as many as possible at the end during our question and answer. Uh, time frame. Now the purpose of Seaweed Days is to create more seaweed enthusiasts around the world. And here to help us with that is Dr. Carlos Drews, Drews, excuse me. Dr. Carlos Drews is the Executive Vice President for Conservation at OceanWise in Vancouver. Before that, he served as the Executive Director of the Jane Goodall Institute in the US. He's a native of Columbia his career spans three decades working on wildlife conservation, including 13 years with the WWF, leading its species and fisheries team in Latin America and the Caribbean, and later as global director of species conservation. His PhD in zoology from the University of Cambridge earned him the John Napier Medal of Primate Society of Great Britain. Carlos was also awarded the Lieber Press International Award in 2015 in Girona, Spain. It's my pleasure to introduce our second speaker in the industry speaker series, Dr. Carlos Drews. Thank you, Erin. It's really a pleasure to be with all of you today. I'm speaking from Vancouver, Canada, and I feel really honored and grateful to speak from the unceded territories of the Musqueam, the Squamish, and the tsleil Nation. 20 years ago, I was actually kayaking in Costa Rica off the Pacific coast. And I went out, it was a very calm day, calm bay, and saw this thing shining uh, above the water surface back there. And so I, I started to approach gradually until I realized it was the back of a humpback whale and she was just sunbathing there nicely. What an extraordinary view. Uh, I was close. The animal was calm. I thought I must get my children to see this. So I turned around the kayak and started paddling, paddling very aggressively again back to the shore and then ran to the children, disrupted their plays and their games. This was my four and, and seven year old at the time, daughter and son. Put them on the kayak and told them, let's go out and see a whale. Of course, they couldn't believe what I was talking about. So we started paddling again and paddle, paddle, paddle out. But now the shape had changed. And uh, as we approached, it took us 10, 15 minutes to get there. I saw that the back of the female humpback was right there and she was holding on her rostrum, the calf, a baby whale sunbathing the calf above the water surface. And we just continued to approach very gently. 
and my children were in absolute awe looking at this extraordinary creature. And then when they turned around to look at their dad, the dad was just weeping and crying. I don't know what it is, but getting close to a whale is just this emotional experience. And we were really close and at water, uh, water surface level. It was a, a very, very memorable moment for me. And for my children, it was like, what on earth is happening? Are we sinking? Is this dangerous? Why is daddy crying? But anyway, after that, uh, I did some reflecting about this. And this was 20 years ago. Uh, humpback whales were not necessarily very common back then, but they were on the recovery path. And today, the happy news is they are no longer a threatened species. How did that happen? There was an international moratorium on whaling that started in the 80s after about 20 years of uh, hard work by conservationists and some governments who wanted to see whaling stop and then it actually happened. And then whales, the majority, but not all of them, really started recovering and humpback whales are one of these incredible success stories that tells us that if we leave the ocean alone, if we drop our pressure from the ocean, marine life will actually come back. It will come back in extraordinary ways. I will now uh, share my screen with you to walk you through what I consider is ocean positive seaforestation. Ocean positive seaforestation is really a different way to look at this sector, but not uh, in any way an unexpected one. I will now walk you through, through this. And essentially what we see now is that the oceans are subject to tremendous pressures by people, but we are unable to look at the oceans and see their misery because we are terrestrial primates essentially. And as terrestrial primates, we look at the surface of the ocean and we think it's all fine. We don't look underwater. This deterioration is what we don't see. The ocean seems healthy when we look at it, unlike degraded lands and forests, which we can identify at first sight as, as in trouble. And the oceans are vast, so vast that humans were tempted to think that its resources were limitless. Now we know better, but connecting to the plight of the oceans is still a challenge for many people. Let me walk you here through a very complicated graph, but definitely one that deserves your attention. This is from uh, Carlos Duarte's paper with many collaborators came in nature uh, last year in April called Rebuilding Marine Life. And here they present this historical view of pressures on the ocean. As you can see this graph here that at the top is hunting pressure. Hunting pressure refers a lot to marine mammals uh, and, and other, uh, other large, uh, large animals. And the color indicates when the peak of the maximum pressure is, if it's purple, and then as it gets lighter in color, uh, the pressure reduces. And you can see that the history of hunting is such that the peak already happened and we are now on much better grounds towards low pressure. If we look at fishing, the picture is interesting too, because many of you uh, may think as I did too, that uh, we are at the peak of uh, global pressure on our fishing uh, resources, but we seem to be past that peak uh, in the 90s and the 2000s, and now the pressure continues to be high, but doesn't seem to be anymore at its maximum. And we are seeing several uh, fish stocks uh, in several ocean bases already showing signs of recovery. I don't want to sugarcoat uh, the picture here. We know that many fisheries are in dire straits, uh, but this is the global trend, and I think we should be aware of that. Deforestation really talks to mangroves primarily, uh, and uh, the peak is passed already. We are still at high to medium pressure on, on that. Uh, but again, good news, thanks to the great efforts of the conservation organizations, civil society groups, indigenous groups, and governments. And then on habitat loss, well, this speaks among other things uh, to seagrasses, to coral reefs, and all these other habitats. Again, we seem to be past the peak of uh, the highest pressure and uh, slowly, slowly moving towards low pressures here. With fertilizers and with climate change, however, the news are not good. We are really at the maximum pressure on the ocean resources. But the fundamental message of this paper is that rebuilding marine life can be done. The good news is within the next 30 years, 
There is a roadmap in this paper that tells us what to do, and then it can actually be done. We can restore these ecosystem services on which humankind uh, so much depends. If we look at restoration projects worldwide, there has been a gradual increment in these kinds of projects. And if you see the, the chart in front of you and you look at the color gray, those are kelp restoration projects. Uh, with green, you see mangroves. Uh, in pink, you see salt marshes, coral reefs in lilac. And just look over time. We are now uh, starting the 90s here, uh, how all these restoration projects continue to mushroom around the world, a great indication of a collective momentum that is building up uh, with seaweed restoration projects lingering behind all the others, but several good examples in the North America coast, around here uh, in particular, and then in Europe, in Chile, and also uh, down south in uh, Australia, Tasmania, but also in Japan. This is the uh, global trend of uh, restoration projects. And here on this graph, what you can see is that kelp, the gray here at the bottom, is really lingering way behind restoration efforts worldwide. But it can be done. And in Duarte's paper, we see a few examples of that, uh, like this uh, kelp bed of Saccharina japonica in Japan, uh, before and after. And also this one here in uh, Chile which uh, again shows how impoverished uh, the habitat can be, but how well it can actually return uh, to its close to original state uh, if, we, if we do the right thing. The kelp forests of the world are under danger and uh, they are in serious jeopardy, particularly because of climate change. And you know that kelp is very sensitive to warm uh, water events uh, which are becoming more intense and more frequent with climate change. But then there are other pressures as well. And you know that the demise of sea otters uh, causes sea urchin populations to explode. And then these are grazers and they can do considerable harm to kelp beds as well. Uh, and there are other threats. Bottom line is kelp forests need our help. Absolutely need our help. And uh, the first time that actually kelp got my attention was, uh, was last year, being around here in Vancouver uh, and uh, in British Columbia, where kelp are an essential part of the marine ecosystems. And I started the conversations with uh, seaweed farmers and, uh, and other people interested in kelp. I had just so much to learn. The first bit was this notion of kelp can actually sequester CO2. Uh, the IPCC, the International Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, has incorporated significant carbon removal from the atmosphere as a part of the key actions that humankind must take to mitigate climate change and hopefully be able to stay under 1.5 or 2 degrees of warming by the end of the century. Now I know about the many more positive aspects of seaweed conservation and management, and you too. So as we heard this morning uh, being presented by, by the other speakers. So the cost of inaction on seaweed is monumental, but it is only recently that this is being recognized more widely. Most of the references in publications and public species, speeches on ocean-based climate solutions really speak to mangrove seagrasses and salt marshes, much less to the great potential of seaweed. And uh, it may be partly so because there are still some key questions out there that we need to answer. And partly because it's only now that a global choir for the value of seaweeds is starting to emerge. And uh, this seaweed festival is a great contributor to the global seaweed symphony uh, that is in the making and uh, of which we all want to be a part of. On the climate front, there are uh, various pillars uh, that seaweed can contribute to. You know about carbon sequestration, basically carbon being trapped in the tissue that grows so much faster than any terrestrial plants and eventually as the tissue uh, uh, breaks up and then gets deposited in the sediment, uh, it can be trapped then for centuries. If it's in the abysses of the ocean, then this trapping can be considered close to permanent. But kelp is more than that. It also helps with buffering acidification locally around the kelp uh, forest uh, and inside the kelp forest. And also we heard this morning about uh, uh, reducing the emissions of methane. Uh, from beef. And that's a very interesting above the water contribution of kelp to mitigate climate change. There is also the notion of kelp forests uh, acting as wave attenuators, protecting the shoreline from potential erosion during extreme weather events. And extreme weather events are becoming just so much more frequent and more intense with climate change 
that uh, kelp forests are gaining, of course, in value uh, as one of the natural infrastructure that protects the coast. So what does this journey look like? For me, it's about possibility. It's about doing what is possible. Uh, it's about trying not to get paralyzed by some of the scientific uncertainties. Pursue those uncertainties, and the scientists need to do that to inform what practitioners like conservation organizations, uh, seaweed cultivators, coastal communities, are doing in the water. So it's about possibility. This can be done. We have a scientifically well-grounded horizon of rebuilding marine life and uh, seaweeds are an integral part of that solution. It is about working with enthusiasm and the Seaweed Festival is the best example of enthusiasm. Uh, look at the 700 plus uh, people who register for the, for the festival and that number will continue to increase probably during the week. We need enthusiasm and nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm, as uh, Waldo Emerson used to say. And it's all about impact in the water. Conservation is conservation when it hits the water, otherwise it is conversation. And we are interested in impact in the water and all of you around here who are either consumers of seaweed or uh, producers of seaweed or just interested in uh, getting more seaweed into the water, are thinking about impact in the water. Every second breath we take comes from the oceans, the largest oxygen factory on the planet. Three billion people around the world depend on wild caught and farmed seafood as a major source of protein. Fishing alone supports more than 260 million jobs. And in fact, ocean related jobs have grown at three times the rate of the national average. The ocean is a lifeline for people around the world, generating at least $3.1 trillion worth of products and services each year, that's US dollars. Only a healthy ocean can keep this economic engine running, the so-called blue economy. And then there are numerous less tangible services derived from the oceans, uh, their cultural value, uh, relaxation and nourishment for the soul, the aesthetic appreciation. Uh, the oceans are a playground for many, divers, uh, surfers, swimmers, uh, and all of those uh, uh, users of the ocean in one way or the another co contribute to the blue economy, to the services that the ocean provides, rely on those services for the benefits that they derive from the ocean. But there is also the intrinsic value of marine life. I believe that improving ocean health is not an option. It is a duty. Our children and the next generations of humans deserve no less, and marine life deserves no less. It is the right thing to do. I seriously come to uh, believe that do no harm is just not good enough. Uh, the concept of sustainable is a do no harm concept. We must move to ocean positive action. That means leaving the ocean in a better state than, uh, than we find it uh, at the beginning of our activities. And several of the seaweed farmers here in British Columbia have fully embraced the notion of ocean positive uh, corporate practices, including Cascadia, Canadian Pacifico, Canadian Kelp Resources, the Kelp Collective, uh, and there may be others I am unaware of. That is a very powerful and inspiring statement for the sector worldwide. Now let me walk you through what this journey looks like at OceanWise, uh, the organization that I represent. We have one decade, the scientists tell us, to turn the tide. And we have created a conservation strategy with a few uh, conservation initiatives that address ocean pollution, overfishing, and climate change. And the one I would like to focus on is seaforestation. So what is actually seaforestation? Uh, this term really encapsulates the act of restoring, planting, managing, and caring for the underwater seaweed forests. Our seaforestation initiative can be summarized, and if I may read this to you, as the responsible expansion of seaweed such that environmental returns are maximized and equitable sharing of benefits with coastal communities is assured. The seaweed movement is one of great momentum and great excitement because seaweeds are becoming this kind of epicenter of environmental solutions. There are numerous benefits of seaweed products, like for food security, nutrition, cosmetics, pharmaceuticals, and so forth. We've heard about them this morning. 
but here on this slide is a sample of how seaforestation generates environmental returns. Look, for example, at biofuels uh, to help the decarbonization of uh, shipping, uh, which is a key issue in the Arctic, or kelp forest as uh, salmon habitat, and salmon being, again, the prey of killer whales. And if we are concerned about whale conservation, then this behooves us to protect all of the habitats of their prey. Kelp is also a fascinating underwater buffer for, uh, for the noise generated by shipping, for example, which is disruptive of the communication of cetaceans underwater. And this is something that hasn't been really as yet quantified and really uh, properly studied, but it's a definite avenue as well. Uh, one more benefit to marine life that kelp forests may provide, particularly in areas around uh, Vancouver, where you see these lanes of traffic from Asia and from down south in, in America coming our way and becoming really lanes of underwater noise. Then there is kelp as a source of biopolymers, for example, and plastic, uh, plastic alternatives is a fascinating one. During COVID, we've seen, of course, uh, an extraordinary uh, growth of uh, single-use plastic use, uh, particularly for home deliveries. We can do much better than that, and seaweed is there to help us. And then there is seaweed as fiber for textiles potentially, and I will show you something about that in a moment. And then of course, all of the climate benefits that I already mentioned. This list of environmental returns, I'm sure is wrong. That means it is incomplete. There is just so much out there already and so much still out there to be discovered about the benefits of seaweed that this slide will continue to evolve in the time to come. So the potential of seaweed in products and environmental solutions grows and grows and grows. I undertook uh, a little exercise before this presentation of starting to Google things. If you Google seaweed car, what will you find? Well, this is what you find, that uh, we, there is already a car that covered 50 miles with seaweed biofuel, and that was in December 2019. Uh, this is the biofuel kind of venture uh, of, of seaweed. If you Google seaweed and seaweed dress, what do you find? I found many things, but one that caught my attention was a fashion designed by Jas Jasmine Lennington uh, and based out of uh, Scottish seaweeds. Uh, she's producing extraordinary ornaments, but also moving into the fiber production that includes uh, seaweed, and that's a fascinating field. And then I did my final one just because I was, I was really curious. What happens if you Google seaweed shoe? Oh, there is a shoe made out of sargassum uh, in Mexico. It includes recycled plastic bottles, a little bit of seaweed, and there you have your seaweed shoe. So environmental returns are vast. I see the environmental, social, and economic returns as inextricably linked. And ocean-wise, the sphere of influence is really anchored in the environmental field. We see Ocean Wise's role as the orchestrator of an amazing coalition of the willing to advance our seaforestation vision. Some seaweed farmers and other, uh, other um, uh, players have requested that Ocean Wise become the clearinghouse for seaforestation projects that provide answers to the many questions associated with the responsible expansion uh, of restoration and uh, seaweed cultivation. We are committed to help advance an ocean positive seaforestation agenda. Uh, with several of you here on this call today. And we can grow into becoming the verifier of the environmental impacts of seaforestation operations based on our track record of sustainability assessments in the seafood sector that some of you are familiar with. In the next decade, this is what OceanWise uh, is committing to do. We will work on restoration of kelp habitats in British Columbia and exporting those lessons to other places around the world. We want to create this pre-competitive alliance with the seaweed industry where academia, coastal communities, indigenous knowledge comes together to inform with the best knowledge site selection, how to maximize environmental returns, how to minimize climate risk uh, and other questions like that. And we want to share uh, restoration processes with some citizen action teams so that we can include people, include the everyday person around the excitement that there is about seaweed and for them to have an avenue uh, to compensate for their carbon footprint potentially. We want to create a vehicle for kelp permaculture, kelp cultivation that really is based on ecosystem health and giving back to the ecosystem. 
and one that maximizes environmental returns at scale. And last but not least, we want to partner with coastal communities and with First Nations as the right holders of kelp habitats and custodians of the relevant and traditional ecological knowledge that will allow this expansion of seaweed to be res responsible. We cannot do this alone. Uh, we have to rely absolutely on extreme collaboration to get this done. OceanWise is humble and it is a small organization, uh, but the collective effort is what will make an incredible uh, uh, difference here. We have joined the Safe Seaweed Coalition that you heard about this morning by Vincent, uh, and we have several partners that have signed on to the shared vision of ocean positive expansion of seaweed. I want to leave you with that and with an invitation to continue to hold hands. This is a very exciting time uh, for seaweed expansion. I know that you can all be a part of it, either as uh, producers at the producing end, as scientists that contribute to answer all these incredible questions, as the rightful custodians of kelp habitat uh, in coastal communities, but also as consumers of seaweed products, engineers that may want to contribute their high tech and, uh, and extraordinary ways to monitor uh, the impacts of kelp. You're all most welcome. These are very exciting times. Thank you very much. Wow, Carlos, I found myself nodding throughout your presentation in agreement uh, and excitement. Um, you identified that time is not on our side, but uh, you also provided me with hope that there's a solution that we can um, uh, solve the climate crisis by growing more seaweed uh, around the world and using seaweed in our lives. And I wanted to thank you for that touching story you shared at the beginning of your presentation about um, the whale and, and your children. That was a beautiful way to start the presentation. Thank you. Uh, we do have some questions uh, rolling in. Um, the first one, I'm going to just uh, check the cat, uh, chat here, is from Kaylee. Are there any books that you would recommend to learn more about kelp? Indeed, and uh, I was not prepared for the question, but uh, I hid this copy of uh, wait a minute, of Louis Drules' uh, Bible, Pacific Seaweeds, and I do encourage you to go and, uh, and secure yourself a copy. It's an extraordinary piece, lots of uh, beautiful ways to learn about kelp, identify the most common species uh, here in this uh, North American uh, waters of the Pacific and also including some recipes, but also uh, topics like management and so forth. This has to be a, a must have for everybody interesting seaweeds. Yeah, that's a great one. It's, uh, we've got multiple copies in the office here at Cascadia. Uh, I'd also like to recommend a book called Slime by Ruth Cassinger. It's extremely entertaining, um, a, an easy read, but you learn about the history of algae and it, how important it is to, um, uh, to oxygen and to our, our livelihood, actually. So that's a good one. Oh, and Louis Drool is our keynote speaker at the professional development workshop on, on Wednesday morning. So if you're uh, registered for that, you'll actually get to hear from uh, the godfather of seaweed himself. Okay, we have lots of questions coming in. Uh, Ashley asks, what does pre-competitive mean in your goal to create a pre-competitive alliance with the seaweed industry, academia, and the community? Beautiful, beautiful question. And uh, I'm a biologist. Uh, I'm not in business or anything. I'm learning my lingo as well. But look how interesting. In the business sector, uh, these different companies that are striving to uh, sell the products and similar products to the same people are basically competitors. Uh, so when we talk about a pre-competitive space, it is a space where uh, the different companies do not perceive themselves as competitors. Uh, it's, uh, if anything, they consider themselves as peers, uh, as opportunities to learn from each other, and particularly to find answers to those questions that are in the way of them running the business in the ocean positive way that they want. So a pre-competitive space is a, a very friendly space. It's a, it's a space of curiosity, of holding hands, of collaboration. And that's what we are uh, looking forward to facilitate. And uh, we have several uh, partners of the, of the seaweed uh, cultivation uh, sector already on board in a very pre-competitive spirit, which is really one of sharing what you've learned, sharing your concerns, sharing your resources, your sources of knowledge as well. 
You know, we have felt uh, from Cascadia's perspective, we have felt the industry to be truly collaborative. We have had conversations with uh, with folks in Australia, the South Australian government, actually, they're presenting this afternoon um, with folks in the UK, Arctic seaweed, for example, uh, um, all uh, your fo yourself and, and folks at OceanWise, it really feels like a collaborative sector and uh, on Thursday afternoon when we launch our our brands our products and we enter that uh, that space of competition for goods um, we hope to be uh, uh, encouraging people to do better to make good choices and and that it's okay to try all sorts of these wonderful products that are all making a positive impact on the climate that's wonderful uh, okay who we we have Lorna what is the what are the main barriers? that the kelp industry is facing at the moment? What needs to be addressed before the industry can really scale up? Lorena, thank you very much for an absolute key question here. And it differs, depends on where you are on the planet. Uh, sometimes the regulatory frameworks are such that it is easier to get an oil concession in the ocean than to get a seaweed uh, permit to operate. So a lot to do there. Uh, we heard Minister Jordan this morning from uh, the Department of Fisheries and Oceans speak about her own enthusiasm about seaweed and the expansion of seaweed as, a, as an extraordinary, uh, what I consider ocean positive uh, sector of the industry. So we will hope uh, that hopefully the regulatory framework will also be adjusted so that it facilitates the responsible expansion of seaweed. And I think underlying responsible, no one wants to go uh, absolute rogue with, uh, with the oceans, mess with them and potentially end up uh, causing more harm than good. But with seaweed, we seem to believe that uh, uh, we can start making steps that are no regrets in our path to learn where actually the boundaries, the environmental boundaries, uh, where there may be uh, operational safety boundaries. And we heard Evan Sanz speak about the importance of, uh, of safety it's environmental safety, it's operational safety and food safety as well. Uh, so there are, there are obstacles there. Other obstacle that I identify is just the lack of awareness and the lack of knowledge about the incredible potential that there is for seaweed. Uh, so some of the great minds around the seaweed expansion are, are clamoring uh, for the support of uh, investors. And the investors are still a little bit on the hesitant side, if I may generalize, and any generalization is bound to be wrong, but they are waiting to see, uh, for example, can we actually deliver on the promise of uh, seaweed being this extraordinary carbon drawdown mechanism? Uh, calculations are happening. Professor Carlos Duarte has a, a team of people working precisely on this question. And some of the seaweed farmers in BC have contributed to a particular study that is geared toward understanding carbon sequestration potential in seaweed farms specifically. Uh, there is also the deep water dreamers, uh, dreamers and doers, I have to say. Uh, and that's a fascinating avenue because uh, on top of the abysses of the ocean, uh, you can almost guarantee that that seaweed will actually get deposited and trapped at 3,000 meters below, where water temperatures are four degrees, where there's very little decomposition, uh, eventually carbon sequestration at its best. So can we maximize the carbon sequestration? And I dare to say that if you have a seaweed operation on the coast and you declare that 10% of your production will be uh, returned to the ocean, and then you actually find a carbon low, a low carbon footprint way of transporting that seaweed, that 10%, and dropping it over the abysses of the ocean, that will maximize the carbon sequestration contribution of your operation. So I would say that it's about really bringing this knowledge, this awareness uh, about the potential, but also the good science that needs to come into it and great practice so that investors are convinced. Uh, those I believe are some of the key obstacles here. Uh, you would also need to think about the practicalities of doing this at scale, because I'm talking here thousands and thousands of hectares if we want to make a difference of planetary uh, significance. And you don't have to immediately visualize a drone image of, uh, of thousands and thousands of hectares taking over a particular spot of the ocean. It can also be a mosaic of small coastal seaweed operations scattered all along the fjords and beautiful um, uh, waters here of uh, British Columbia, of Alaska, down to California. Then hop over the tropics and you find yourself in Chile. And down south in the Macadanes province, there is a great project taking, taking, taking off 
uh, with an indigenous community there uh, for seaweed cultivation as well. You add all of that up, including what is happening in Europe, uh, in Tasmania, uh, what will happen, which is a huge project off the coast of, Na of Namibia. And then you look at South Korea, Japan, China, uh, maybe Indonesia potentially as well with tropical seaweeds. And it does add up. And it's this collective area and the collective drawdown that you can get from the responsible expansion of seaweed what will make a difference uh, for uh, climate change. Beautiful. Uh, Brian had a question about the negatives, but I think you've done a good job at addressing uh, addressing that and, um, and flipping that upside down, that there's no choice. We need to scale up the production of seaweed around the world. George has a question. Marine biologists are studying the process of rebalance between kelp beds, explosive populations of sea otters, and their aggressive consumption of shellfish in the northwest coast of Vancouver Island. This is possible where there is not much commercial shell fishing. How do we deal with this when sea otters start threatening crab fisheries in places like Tofino and Euculip? A fascinating question and uh, one that we struggle very often on numerous fronts in ocean conservation. I don't have a direct answer to you because we are learning as we're doing as conservation practitioners. One of the issues with conservation organizations and with conservation minded people is that we have to be responsible for the positive impacts of our actions. And that is to say, if conservation is successful, there will be more sea otters in the ocean. What the, does that mean? And we are behooved to take responsibility over managing that situation in a way that it doesn't just go out of hand. Uh, I used to live in the tropics uh, for many years and I was responsible for a marine turtle conservation program. And here we were dealing with one of the greatest threats to marine turtles, which is bycatch, when they get entangled in the nets and the hooks of the, of the fishing uh, fleets. Uh, and the fishermen, they, they are not interested in the bycatch. It, it's a pain. I mean, the turtles upset the nets and the fishing operation and so forth. So they were allies in trying to solve this problem. Uh, but for me, the question was, marine turtles for now, are uh, the majority are in danger. What if they go back uh, to the baseline uh, of 200 years ago, really abandoned? And when I mean abandoned, uh, imagine the Spanish vessels coming from Spain to colonize the Americas. And as they arrived into the Bay of Havana in, uh, in Cuba, the boat this was at night and they were arriving and the people were kind of sleeping in the boat and they started uh, feeling this doom, 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 doom from the side. They were hitting turtles, hundreds and thousands of turtles that were uh, there uh, sleeping in the, in the bay. And that's what oceans would look like if we went back to those incredible basins. What problems do we then create as conservationists in bycatch and so forth? What uh, problems are we already kind of uh, in the middle of solving with the rebounding of whales uh, around these waters and the probability of ship strikes? Uh, and we are solving those. Uh, but what I want to say is also for your situation in Tofino, about which I know little, uh, we must in the environmental sector also take responsibility to find adequate solutions. I am very happy, of course, for the return of the sea otters. I need to see a balance between uh, the sea otters the other imbalances of the ecosystem in such a way that we go back to a state where there is harmony and not just harmony between the animals, but also harmony between the marine life and the users of the marine life. Well, that's great, Carlos. Um, along that line, William has a question. What potential is there for integrated multi-trophic aquaculture, seaweed, shellfish, and finfish, and can this be scaled up? And before you get going, Carlos, if you'd like to comment on this one, we do have a presentation from Linda Sams, who I think is here with us today, uh, tomorrow, to talk about IMTA. Uh, but did you have something to add, Carlos? Fantastic. Uh, I'd rather not reveal uh, some of the pieces that you will see tomorrow, but just to say that uh, uh, seaweed has been discovered really as this uh, additional element in aquaculture that can clean your water, that can, that can be of so many benefits. And it's integrated uh, multi-tropic aquaculture that behooves me also to another term, which is called permaculture. And we know of permaculture in terrestrial ecosystems, but increasingly some of the thought leaders around the world, including Brian von Herzen from the Climate Foundation, 
has been advocating for the use of permaculture in the ocean. It's a mariculture that is really based on ecosystem health and returning to the ecosystem what it needs to be even more productive and uh, more healthy. So the potential of this kind of approach and integrating multitropic aquaculture is really another way to look at permaculture uh, is, is vast because it's the ocean positive way of doing business. And the more consumers start demanding that as a principle in the products that they choose, uh, the more pressure there will be for, uh, for some of the laggards in the industry uh, to actually come on board and start approaching the industry in that way, in a way that looks at ecosystem health maximizing productivity without uh, without harming the ocean and leaving the ocean in a better state than the found. Beautiful. Are there any final comments, any calls to action that you'd like to leave uh, leave the audience with today, Carlos? Oh, thank you for that. Well, this is an audience. Uh, I believe I'm talking here to the converted. I don't need to convince uh, the people who actually took the time uh, to register for the seaweed festival about the merits of seaweed. Uh, and the merits of a, a responsible seaweed expansion. I would just encourage you all to continue to do your, your bit, your contribution, your two cents from where, wherever you sit, whether you are at the producer end, whether you're sitting at the consumer end, academia, as I said before, coastal communities, uh, First Nations very much interested in the subject matter, engineers that want to learn more, and maybe the odd investor that may be joining this, uh, this seaweed festival as well. Uh, continue to approach it from your angle, uh, be receptive uh, to the uh, revolution that we heard uh, to, uh, was, what was referred to this morning, the seaweed revolution. The Safe Seaweed, uh, Safe seaweed Coalition will be a global umbrella uh, that will be a go-to for exchanges of uh, best practice, cross-fertilization of knowledge, and OceanWise is definitely committed to do their part uh, as being an orchestrator for those efforts as well. Uh, so just uh, join the crowd. I think there are so many partnerships out there that you can be a part of. Pick the one that you like uh, and go with it. This is about sharing. This is about holding hands in a big way for something that is incredibly promising. That's wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos, for the inspiring presentation, for taking time out of your busy schedule to be with us today. That's uh, very meaningful to me personally uh, and to our whole planning team here at uh, Cascadia Seaweed and Seaweed Days. Um, to the audience, thank you for your time uh, for joining us today. If we haven't got to your question, um, I hope to uh, to go through them at the end. And, and if there's any big ones, I'll write to Carlos and we'll get those answered and, and posted. Um, posted up for you. And I'd also like to thank VAIA, the Vancouver Island Economic Alliance, for uh, being with us today, providing support, and delivering the industry speaker series during, during CV Days. Um, we will be posting some of our recordings up on our YouTube channel, the Cascadia Seaweed YouTube channel. If you were uh, late to join us today, then you'll be able to catch this uh, amazing presentation um, on our YouTube channel. And uh, that's it for me. We have a seaweed session coming up at three o'clock this afternoon, and I hope to see you all online during the week. Thank you so much. Take care.